everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm just jumping out of my skin because I'm so excited to see these practicum presentations come to life in these 10 minute blurbs that you guys are going to get, which I know these students could talk about for hours and I wish they could, but I also know that we don't have 24 hours or 48 hours as the years of practice and presentations. Uh, my name is Ravi Sterling. I run the master's program in information and communication technology for development. And this is our third group of students to complete their master's level practicums, which are much more exciting than writing a thesis. Uh, they still do have to write a paper, but you get to, you know, the fact is you get to go into the field for a few months and have adventures like, um, I don't know, hang out with naked himbo women. <laughs> <laughs> um, and learn the secrets of, 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 of braided hair or uh, canoe single-handedly and solo in a dugout canoe down the Amazon River. I'm, we need to talk about that later. <laughs> You're not actually supposed to do that. Or uh, go off to the only place in Kenya I said to not go off to during the elections and be like, I thought maybe you'd make an exception for me, Revy. And uh, that's great. Um, and also stay local and have some really amazing adventures here that have turned into things like uh, deciding in the last few weeks after working on a practicum presentation, uh, after working on practicum research, to go pursue a PhD. Okay, because because three months weren't enough. You want to add another five years to that. So I want to tell uh, to tell you a little bit about the order of the presentations we're going to to hear about today. Um, the first we're going to have is Joellen, who is also celebrating a birthday um, today. <laughs> So by all means, she gets the very first cupcake at the end here, and we will sing, but we'll sing to you outside there, okay, because there's a mic here and we don't want that, all right? Um, and I will let the students talk about their presentations, but just to give a little context, uh, Joellen was working with Elephant Energy in Namibia. Um, Mustafa Nassim will be going second. Uh, we're, I just want you to say about you, I mean, I can't believe you're leaving us to go to Pakistan, of all, you know, you, we have to keep you here. Uh, Mustafa came to us as a Fulbright Fellow, which means his, his uh, time in the U.S. was uh, on his two-year mark, but um, you've just been such an incredible asset here, and he got to work as our first practicum student that worked in D.C., kind of looking at the policy end of technology, um, and that came from his work uh, with uh, Jill Van Maitri and Dale Hatfield and other members of the ITP community. Uh, proving that interdisciplinary research truly is interdisciplinary and we're bringing departments together. Um, Neil, from my beloved Kenya, I, you're wearing, you're going Kenyan. All right, you know, don't go to Mombasa during election, I'm in Mombasa. All right, great. Uh, Abby, who did some incredible work um, here and also in Peru during her practicum. Uh, Chris Gruth, who got to take a jaunt over to London uh, which is always exciting, and I'm surprised you came back. You, know, you both fell sharp in your purple. Um, but uh, learned some, some great skills and ideas for working with local diaspora communities. He's going to talk a little bit about his work with the Southern Sudanese um, uh, migra migrated families here. Uh, Isla, who had the fun of also being local and being in my office. You got to know me way too much. You know, I'm just like, she became my mac and cheese buddy. I'm like, Isla, mac and cheese, now we got to talk about this stuff. Um, and, and McLeese, who did survive her Amazonian trip. Um, before I do that, I do want to mention and call it a few people, which are uh, Jill Dupre, the Associate Director of Atlas, and John Bennett, the Director of Atlas, who made all of this possible, quite frankly. So thank you very much. And, <laughs> and because at the end we're going to want to be singing Joellen um, a song and getting to cupcakes, I just want to recognize uh, Rache Cohen and Vicky Stubbs for completely keeping me on the rails and the students on the rails during the practicums. Um, these would not have been possible. So just. So we're going to start in the order that I actually presented the folks. So that means Joellen, you are up. All right. Congratulations. All right. Well, I know you can do this yourself, but how many more, how many more weeks do I get to do this? Great, great, great. Micromanage, micromanage. All right. Okay. Oh, I need the 10 minute stopwatch, sorry. Okay. I need 10 minutes and 45 seconds, please. <laughs> all right. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming. I especially want to take, thank Revy, my cohort, Rache, 
my friends who very many of them, maybe all of them are here today, and my family, and my practicum partners. I had the um, opportunity to spend 10 weeks in Namibia, and I'm going to have 10 minutes to tell you about that. <laughs> Wait, really? How come this is moving? Okay, we get to start over. <laughs> it's moving without me touching it. Well, that's kind of scary. <laughs> it's technology. <laughs> it's a very sensitive. Uh, Chris actually has a okay. USB uh, presenter we can move. Okay, no, 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 this is okay. Okay, we can use this right. instead. Yeah. It's my computer, so it has some issues. Okay. okay. No, I, I think it's okay. Right. Okay, great. All right. So thank you all for coming. I have 10 minutes to tell you about 10 weeks, which was a pretty big 10 weeks in my life. So um, you may want to ask me more, so let's have coffee, or you can read the many, many Facebook posts that I put out while I was away. I'm going to talk a bit about the who and the where, the what, um, you know, what the needs were on my, at my project site, how I address those needs, that really is a bummer, and the road ahead. I had the great pleasure of working with Elephant Energy that's based in Denver, Colorado, and they have operations in Namibia and the Navajo Nations in the Four Corners under the name of Eagle Energy. And Elephant Energy – okay, so if I just hit the arrows there. Okay. I know. Heather said, try this out before you do it. Heather was right. Okay, so um, it's based in Namibia in the Navajo Nation. It was founded by Doug Vilsack in 2008 when he literally showed up in Namibia with a backpack of solar powered torches in his, on himself after spending time there and seeing what the needs were. The vision of light in every home was truly started then. Namibia. Well, besides not being able to pronounce it, most people don't know where it is. And it's really quite far south in Africa, alongside South Africa. Um, not not uh, as south as South Africa, as Quinn informed me. But to give you a bit of context, Namibia is about twice the size of Texas. So it's very big, with not a very big population. It has about a tenth of the population of Texas. So there's really vast, wide open rural spaces, and only about 15% of the households in those rural spaces have access to electricity. So my orientation was getting to visit all of the six regions with a consultant from IDE India, and my, um, I'm so afraid this is going to move forward, and my uh, my um, Namibian program manager, Hamutwe. We went and we observed all the operations. We conducted energy use and marketing surveys. And what I learned was that for about 180, people are spending 180 Namibian dollars a month on candles to light their home and batteries for their radios, which are really important in a country that had war only 23 years ago. So the return on investment is really quick, three months, less than three months, people can pay off that light. And even uh, the Himba tribe said they'd be willing to sell a goat uh, to, in order to buy a Franklin Car light. And they really could do that. So this project was a departure from the model of aid, uh, you know, as distributing the lights as aid. It was really, it's really about creating livelihoods. And uh, what the project is charged with doing is creating a hub-and-spoke sales network to sell 10,000 lights in one year. The Namibian team consists of a program manager that sits there at the center of the hub, Hamutwe, four regional sales managers who were my main workmates through this project who interact with the regional hub shops, the traveling sales agents, and the uh, rural hub, the rural shopkeepers. And what will happen when this network is fully established is that there will be a distribution chain that spreads across all of northern Namibia. The Denver office is responsible for support and oversight um, responsibilities. So as you can imagine, communication is very important. So that leads to what the needs were, and after I had a chance to get around and see operations firsthand, it became really clear that communication between the 
Oshkati office and Denver office was not really happening. Weekly calls were thwarted every week due to some logistical or communication problem. The RSMs were struggling with the reporting. You're supposed to report how many lights are being sold. And they were struggling, and mostly the process was not happening. Most of the RSMs had really limited computer training, and that got in the way as well, as you can imagine. And then the first question that people were asking is, how many lights have you sold? And people couldn't really answer that question. So I took on these fundamental issues, and between, behind each of the accomplishments is really a backstory. And uh, here's my calendar, my checkoff calendar. Um, but there's a backstory, one that I can imagine dev people share at, with over beers, and I look forward to sharing those stories with my cohorts. Um, but you know, I guess I would take something like connecting to the internet. The one-liner would be. Suspend all your judgment, your expectations, and throw your calendar into the trash bin. Um, but we were eventually able to get Wi-Fi. That's a long story. And now the project manager can communicate directly with the Denver office, mostly excuse-free. I also equipped the RSMs with, the abil with, or, uh, with new notebook computers. So um, this is a huge improvement for them. It's a huge savings of time, a huge quality of life improvement. And another sort of backstory is old broken laptops in Colorado are also old broken laptops in Namibia. Um, I streamlined the reporting process and transitioned from a highly narrative reporting system to a measurement-based system. Um, it's saving a lot of time for the regional sales managers, and it's really providing better, better data for management. And then most important to me, I got to develop and deliver computer training to the RSMs. And uh, we worked specifically on their job task and what they would be doing. And there really is no greater thing than teaching someone cut and paste for the first time and seeing their reaction. <laughs> we, don't, we don't get that. But, you know, we don't get to have that experience much, much here. And that same person last week started messaging me on Google Talk. I didn't teach him that application. He learned that by himself, and he is fully on his way to becoming an IT guy. He loves calling himself an IT person, <laughs> and I think he is. I also brought um, Elephant Energy uh, into this Twitter sphere. So another primary goal was to uh, introduce mobile-based solutions to the project. So I designed and implemented a frontline SMS system for multiple operations. But the most useful one and exciting one is that the regional sales managers can now check with the regional hub shops, find out how many lights have been sold. They can send a quick SMS message to the system. And um, that message gets forwarded to the project manager as well as to the Denver office via a private <coughs> Twitter feed. So really for the first time, there's almost real-time reporting between these two places that are very far away and living at opposite ends of the, the clock, essentially. So Elephant Energy is, is really, to me, a case study of where development is going. So it's moving from an NGO to more, to having an NGO perspective to more of a business perspective. So that means you have to measure differently, you have to report differently, and you have to fund the project differently. And those are some challenges for the project. Managing cultural differences really is a daily issue. A fun issue most of the time, but a daily issue. And establishing a self-sustaining Namibian-run entity is top priority. But when you have to show progress within, when, within a one-year granting cycle, it's almost impossible to keep that priority as your top priority. So capacity <laughs> building is key. Process, process, process. Going, you know, constantly in enhancing computer training and project management training. So I pondered these complications, which eventually showed up, actually was sort of ongoing show up for me, as in the form of a question. And this question I really couldn't answer myself. So actually, on my very last day of work, I asked my boss, Hamutwe, 
is um, you know, this sort of involvement by entities like Elephant Energy and Net Positive at the end of the day. And he didn't hesitate. He said immediately, absolutely, governments move too slowly. So that was what I left the project with. And I'll continue to do some work with Elephant Energy uh, on a volunteer basis as my time permits. I'm going to keep tweeting and uh, supporting the work that I initiated. And if you want to know more about Elephant Energy, you can come on Thursday to a fundraiser in Den Denver, and I can tell you more about that. Thank you very much. <laughs> And then she got to go on safari with her family. And then cool. I got to go on safari. <laughs> Let's take two questions. Two oh, well, we'll take two questions for a practicum uh, presentation and then do more at the, uh, at the Q&A. <coughs> okay. Over. Cupcakes. Anybody have questions for Joanna? Matt. <laughs> well, right yeah. now that answer is still, you know, that's the problem. They don't really have a great hold on that, but they've got the reporting in process now to be able to report those numbers. There's been a few glitches since I left, but hopefully a month from now everyone's going to know exactly how many lights. I think right now it's probably about 50 under this project. They have a project in Caprivi and they've sold 4,000 lights. It distributed and sold 4,000 lights under that project. <coughs> One more hand. Rachel? Hi. Hi. Nice <laughs> to see you. <laughs> was, was there any of this technology that you got to sort of like start designing before you got there, or did you have to do this all on the ground when you were like setting up the frontline SMS and <coughs> reporting and the Twitter stuff? I didn't as actually set anything up before I left, but our, pro our um, lab project was using Frontline SMS. And the interesting part was is that it actually works so much better when you're in a developing country. We had so many problems using Frontline SMS here, but there it was simple. We were also using it in a really straightforward manner. But I really, I, I went with an idea of here's exactly what I'm going to do, and then I got there and saw that there's so much of the foundation that wasn't there. So it was like, oh, I'm going with all my buckets of paint to paint the house, but actually the house wasn't built yet. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I bring up Mustafa and his suit collection from DC. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, today I'll be talking about some of my experiences working in the Internet and Technology Policy Group for Verizon in Washington, D.C. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be going about briefly how I got involved in ICTD policy, and then I'll explain some of the goals and deliverables for my practicum, and uh, towards the end I'll talk, I'll talk about some of the learnings and skills that I've acquired over the last three months. Um, so I've been designing technologies for uh, developing world problems since the summer of 2009, and I've put some of the projects that I've been involved with in different groups and different settings for the last, uh, over the last four years over here, and a lot of the projects that I've been involved with haven't scaled. And uh, apart from maybe uh, the low-cost water purification system that's, uh, that one of my partners is working on in India right now. And so I've been asking myself this question, why don't my project scale, or why don't ICDD projects scale? And one of the answers that I keep getting again and again is there are bigger problems that, that need to be addressed. There are bigger issues that you need to deal with. And there are bigger questions that need to be answered. And so, uh, for example, uh, Dr. Evie Sterling, her PhD dissertation in interactive community radios would not be applicable in Pakistan because there are policies in place that ban interactive com community radios in Pakistan. And so um, I wanted to develop a skill set to find out why you have to pay a lot more for slower broadband in communities where the average income is already lower. And so that's how I started this program, and I got involved with ICDD policy over here. And um, as Ravi mentioned, I'm a Fulbright scholar from Pakistan, and one of the biggest uh, goals of the Fulbright program 
is to bring scholars from developing countries to the U.S. so that they can develop skill sets over here uh, and then go back and solve those problems in their home countries. Pakistan faces immense challenges in the internet, internet and technology policy sphere. Uh, some of them I put on here, but there, there are a number of issues that they really face. One of them is the broadband speeds in Pakistan are really low. It's, the average is about 780 kilobits per second. And uh, the global average for broadband is about 2.8 megabits per second, roughly about four times as much. And um, this is because of lack of uh, competition in the wide broadband market space. Uh, and uh, it also hurts innovation. And you might just ask, uh, and the second problem that Pakistan deals with is uh, they still have an option 3G spectrum. You might ask what spectrum really is. It's essentially a range of frequencies on which electromagnetic waves operate. And uh, the radio spectrum is very uh, scarce. And so the government tightly regulates it. You just can't set up your Wi-Fi router on any frequency you want to operate on. You have to take permission from the government. And so Pakistan has not, uh, the Pakistani government has not given authority to the ISPs to operate in the 3G spectrum sphere, uh, space right now. In terms of the U.S., these are common issues uh, with the U.S. as well. The ISPs have been constantly criticized for having slower broadband speeds in the U.S. compared to the rest of the developed world. And the FCC is re-auctioning, uh, in, uh, through incentive auctions, is reallocating the broadcast spectrum on which broadcasters such as NBC or ABC operate to the ISP so that we can have higher speed mobile broadband. And so I thought it would be a good opportunity to work at Verizon in D.C., find out these policy issues, find out how to design policies, and work with such policies so that once I go back to Pakistan after I graduate, I'd have the skill set to do so in Pakistan. Um, one might ask is, and why is broadband important for, to some, a common person in a developing country? As in, uh, wh why is it so important to have high-speed broadband? Higher, higher speed broadband does not just mean loading YouTube videos faster. It actually does help with connectivity, and uh, Iqbal Qadir, who's the founder of Grameen Phone, actually calls connectivity to be productivity. And so uh, there's a World Bank study that shows, uh, World Bank study for 120 low and middle income uh, countries that show that a 10% increase in broadband penetration increases the GDP by about 1.38%. So it's a multiplier effect that the productivity gains that come to the workplace bring in a lot more foreign in direct investment, et cetera, to increase the GDP. And so the UN has been working towards making broad, increasing broadband deployment option a top priority for developing countries. And the, the goal that they've set is by 2015, all countries in the world should have national broadband plans. Uh, by September of last year, uh, about 119 countries did have national broadband plans. Most of them were developed countries. And the ones that, uh, the ones, uh, the developing countries that did have national broadband plans, there's no guarantee that these plans are going to work uh, or, or that they're tailored towards their local communities. And so I wanted to study this a lot, in a lot more detail, and that's when I started working with Verizon. And so when I started talking with Verizon last uh, semester, they asked me to come in and evaluate U.S.'s leadership position in broadband, in certain areas of broadband, and to f actually figure out where the U.S. actually stands in, in broadband. There's an OECD study that, that's been going around that shows that the average speeds in the U.S. are ranked 15th amongst the OECD countries. And Verizon wanted me to know exactly what these broadband measurements actually do measure, how broadband speeds are measured, and what can the U.S. do to be, to be at the very top. The other thing that they talked about was the FCC, as I mentioned earlier, is doing incentive auctions and they're going to uh, reallocate the spectrum. So Verizon wanted me to look at uh, the proposals being submitted to the FCC by other companies such as Google and Microsoft and see what uses they were putting the spectrum to and figure out how, um, they, uh, how their uses differed from the other, other companies' uses. And lastly, but most importantly, Verizon wanted me to uh, communicate technical information to a non-technical audience. So for example, my boss at, the, uh, at, at Verizon gave presentations to uh, congressmen and staffers about technology issues such as online banking or, or mobile banking, et cetera. And so I was supposed to put this technical information in a, in a version that was easily understandable by audiences that were really smart, but didn't come from a technical background. In terms of my deliverables, I, I've been working on three or four projects over the last three months. Uh, some of which are policy briefs of Verizon. So a policy brief is essentially a very detailed background information, re a lot of research involved in particular areas. I was looking at broadband competition in the U.S. and economic impact of broadband in the U.S., etc. The other thing I was doing was data visualization, and this is something that I had to learn on the fly. As in, I did a graduate certificate while I was at CU in science and technology policy, and I learned to deal with a lot, large data sets and extracting the useful information out of large data sets and presenting it in a format that was useful. 
But over, while I was working at Verizon, I also realized that not a lot of people care about actual reports. You have to present it in a graphical in, uh, format that's a lot more useful. And so I had to do, uh, learn a lot of data visualization techniques over Excel and other softwares, uh, which was, w would have been helpful if I had taken a data visualization class while I was here. Lastly, as I was writing blogs, working with my boss to write blogs about what we've been doing on Verizon's public policy website uh, to disseminate the information that, that we were working on to the rest of the world. And um, um, I was also representing Verizon and attending a lot of events in DC, such as the State of the Net Conference and the Free State Foundation events over there. Um, in terms of my learnings while I was there in DC, one of the things that I've learned is that lawyers in DC will tell you the way they draft the policy is the most important thing. The technologists will tell you the technology is the most important thing. You kind of disobey the laws of physics. And I had the same impression going into DC as an I come from a technology background. Uh, but what I've learned is that, as in what we've seen with the gun laws the day before yesterday as well, was you have to have people, influential people on your side to actually get these policies through. You may be talking about a lot of common sense policies, but they're not going to pass if you don't have the people and the people with the power to support your policies. The second thing that I learned was that you also, the implementing body also needs to have authority and capability to implement such policies. The FCC has come under a lot of direct criticism to not uh, implement the National Broadband Plan very well. Um, I, I tend to disagree, but uh, this is especially more relevant to developing community circumstances where, this, where the national regulators do not have the authority to regulate big telcos that operate in their countries, or even if they do, they do not have the capability to implement such plans properly. Lastly, but most importantly, uh, the dynamics for the developing world are very different from what we see in the U.S. And I gave a presentation while I was at Verizon about the internet and technology policy issues in Pakistan. And one of the things that, that I understood was that the policy needed to be a lot more holistic. So broadband deployment was, not, uh, was, was a key factor, but broadband, for broadband adoption, you also needed to have applications on top of broadband so people would actually adopt broadband, and then you'd have the GDP benefits that come along with it. The second thing that Joellen also mentioned was uh, human capacity building is a huge thing. You need to tell people the kind of things that they can do with broadband, and we take it for granted over here in the U.S., but this is something that you learn when you travel in developing countries a lot, that people do not know the benefits that they can achieve from such, uh, such a marvelous technology. And so um, in the end, I'd like to leave you with this quote from uh, Ban Ki-moon, who's the Secretary General of the U.N., who says that broadband uh, is not just uh, important for sustainable development, but it's also for economic prosperity, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. I, at the end, I'd like to thank Verizon. It was amazing working for them. I could walk into anybody's office and ask any stupid question that I wanted. Uh, <laughs> uh, for Fulbright, for funding my uh, program here and the practicum itself, for uh, Revy, Jill, Roche, everybody at Atlas for making this experience wonderful for me, and the Center of Science and Technology Policy Research, where I did my graduate certificate in Science and Technology Policy. Last but not the least, I'd love to thank uh, Professor Dale Hatfield, Preston Padden, and Dick Green, who not just uh, made this internship possible or this practicum possible, but opened a lot, a lot of doors for me while I was there in Washington, D.C. Thank you. I don't think the World Bank study did take into consideration energy costs. They were looking at broadband penetration in terms of adoption. Okay. And so how many people adopted uh, or took up broadband, and a 10% increase in broadband penetration actually increased the GDP by that much. It's actually a, a really key example that Iqbal Qadir gives in his TED talk is in 1971 when he was in Bangladesh, he was, supposed, he was trying to get medicines for uh, one of his siblings, and he had to walk 10 miles and then found out that the medicine man wasn't there and then had to walk 10 miles back, and he wasted an entire day. And that's a key example. You can do that with telephones, but now with the internet, you can do a lot more, and especially at the workplace. Yeah. Um, do you plan to head right into policy when you back to Pakistan? So I'm, I'm doing a, a few different things right now. Uh, <laughs> and I, I haven't narrowed it down, but broadband policy and internet policy is definitely going to be one of the things that I'm doing. Thanks. Thank you.
always surf safe. Um, I will put a plug in for uh, Jill Dupre's spectrum management class. It'll be a Maymester course this semester, so you know, two or three weeks that actually make the radio spectrum sexy and fun. I took it. Isla's taken it. A few of us have it. It's a very cool course. This is Neil in this Kenyan rose. Come on, try to. Hi, <laughs> You're ahead of me here. You're ahead of me. What was up with the, that seven million threats you had there? <laughs> What'd you put on my computer? <laughs> <laughs> well, Neil came in wanting to do microfinance. I thought we could sway him from the evil side of money, and he's still doing microfinance. So thank you for being here. All right. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for being here on this uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, campus sort of turned into a ghost town pretty fast, so I'm really glad to see a full room here. Um, my name is Neil, and um, I'm talking about Zadisha um, and my experience in Kenya this spring doing peer-to-peer -peer microfinance. And um, so I thought to myself, well, what can I do that will kind of stick with you um, with, with my presentation? Because I can just talk about my work, um, but I wanted to really do something that would stick with you. And so um, to do that, I thought, maybe I can change how you think. Um, because going to Africa for me for the first time, you know, um, I thought that we've really been told this, this uh, singular narrative about Africa, right? We've been told that it's a place of poverty. It's a place of disease. It's a place of violence. And this doesn't really match with my experience on the ground. And I, I think that if you ask most Africans, this isn't what, what they would define um, themselves as. And so today, I wanted to tell some stories that really showcase uh, prosperity, um, peace, and health. And these, um, are, I think, are really what um, are emerging out of Africa. I also wanted to change how you think about development. Um, because for so long, <laughs> development has kind of felt like um, a bunch of people with money and power, and they're kind of out there blindly acting and dumping a bunch of resources on, company, uh, on countries and uh, pulling a lot of political strings, and um, they're not doing a whole lot up there. Um, <laughs> but um, I think an emerging paradigm that we're seeing is that development has come to be defined more by building capacity, by strengthening institutions, um, and by grassroots development. And um, so I think that the West can support uh, the developing world in this role, but um, we're no longer going to be the central actor. It's going to be um, about, about locals. And last, I wanted to change how you think about money, um, especially in the development space, because um, we've seen that money you give it to an NGO, and maybe you don't know where it goes. Maybe it does some good. Maybe it doesn't. Um, one government gives it to another, and it feels like it goes just right down a drain, right? Um, and that's sort of the old paradigm. And also, we kind of face maybe a false choice between doing good with our money and, and getting a return on our money. Um, but that's no longer the case. Um, with websites such as Adisha, um, you're now able to, to have a direct impact on all of these uh, four borrowers' lives, for example, um, these gentlemen living on the coast of Kenya. And um, you're also able to, um, to do good um, by doing well, so to speak, get a return um, on your investment. And so Zadisha, um, I first learned about this US nonprofit a little over a year ago from the School of Business, taking, um, just sitting in on a Francie Milner social entrepreneurship class. And I heard the founder of Zadisha present her idea and um, if you're familiar with Kiva.org, it's a similar model. Um, but the, what they've done is innovate um, on microfinance such that now Kiva has copied their idea and is trying to do the same thing. Um, so when my practicum came up, I was thrilled that, uh, that I was able to um, work with them. And so Zadisha is a web platform uh, that lets you lend money with interest directly to individuals in developing countries. Okay? And um, what's really cool about this is the individual in that country says, I'm willing to repay a loan at X percent interest, and then you could fund them at that level or below. Um, so pretty, pretty cool model. Um, and it's just very, it's very direct right to them. It was started by Julia Kernia in 2009. She was inspired by Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, which talks about leveling the economic playing field using technology. And it was designed to help uh, the world's poorest places with access to low-cost capital. 
My work with Sudisha, um, I was a client relationship manager in Kenya, and um, I was able to serve, orient, and train um, a variety of individuals. I assisted with uh, a readers follow-up, and um, I identified and organized and trained volunteer mentors who are increasingly becoming our, our staff on the ground, our unpaid staff on the ground. Um, very importantly, Julia told me um, at the outset that Zadisha needs human faces. Um, and if you think of this kind of amaphorous technology platform cloud thing, you know, you really want a human face to connect that with. And so I'm not the only face of Zadisha, um, but I was very proud to be a face for Zadisha. Um, and last, I was able to provide feedback kind of on a constant basis um, to, um, to Julia the, and the, the, uh, the upper leadership of, of Zadisha about their, their use of technology, their policies, and a variety of issues. And they always welcome this feedback, and uh, they often acted on it immediately, which is really, really gratifying to see. Um, but going into the field, I asked, you know, what's going to be my biggest impact? What are... What are my big deliverables, if anything? And um, both Revy and Julia said that um, you know my biggest impact was really going to be intangible, and that I would have to be very comfortable with ambiguity and with kind of acting in gray space. I want to tell a story um, just really, really briefly about my friend Duncan. Um, this man is very dear to me, but uh, we were up late one night and discussing his application with Sadisha, and I said. So Duncan, how, how can you communicate best with Sadisha? Um, and I said, can, can you use email? And he said, no, I can't use email. I said, what about SMS? You seem to be, you know, you've sent me a few SMSs in the last few weeks. And he said, yeah, I, I can SMS. Um, I said, okay, well, let's, let's SMS Sadisha together and ask about the status of your application. And so, you know, I, we pull out our phones and I start typing and he said, he said whoa, 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 you're, you're typing really fast. Like the words are appearing really fast. And so how come is that? And I said, Oh, well, I just have my, my phone on T9 prediction. So based on what I type and what the order, it's going to predict how, what, I'm, what I'm saying, right? And so he said, I don't really believe you. This seems like magic. This, this is weird. <laughs> and so I said, no, no, it's not magic. Let me put your phone on T9 Swahili prediction. And now type for me, um, type 52626. Uh, and that spells Jumbo, uh, hello in Swahili. And so he did this, and he was... He was kind of, you know, a, a little bit in disbelief at first, but after about an hour or so, um, I had him um, starting to, to text quite a bit more quickly. Um, and I thought that was just a really cool story to share with you about how um, development, um, at least in my mind, doesn't always have to be about these big, really expensive projects, but it can be really small, little moments like that, and I think those have um, maybe more impact sometimes. Another story I wanted to share is... Um, this is Colette, and she was one of my first borrower visits in Nairobi. And I called her, and I was, I was pretty nervous. Um, I said, you know, hi, this is Neil with Zadisha. I want to come visit your business. And she said, okay. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Someone just calling you on the phone, and yeah, come on over. Um, <laughs> and so um, she and her family gave me a very warm karibu sana. You're very welcome. Um, I took a few hour-long bus rides and, and finally met her and uh, she does um, sewing and embroidery and so with her Zadisha loan she was able to buy a third sewing machine and now her mother is able to sew in addition to she and her sister um, and with the, the extra income that this brings in um, as well as her being able to teach sewing classes with her new sewing machine um, it was going to pay off her loan in about three months um, and then provide income for the rest of the life of the machine. So really good investment on her part. They were just so nice to me. Uh, this is Jacqueline. Jacqueline works in um, a large market in Nairobi. And this is her friend Agre, who works in a stall uh, right next to her. And so they have these neighboring stalls in this uh, very large market. Um, and they're selling women's clothing, OK? And so I contacted them, and I, I visited them, and said, um, well, we, we talked about their business and um, had a couple of good hours chat there. And I said, OK, you know, thanks so much for, for sharing your business. Let's go to the cyber cafe, and let's, let's uh, do a, an orientation. You've only been a borrower with, with Zadisha for about, about a month, and um, let's talk about some of the things you're, about your account and the long-term implications of this. And so we went to a cyber cafe, 
And I said, OK, so who's comfortable using the computer? And Agra said, oh, I'm comfortable. Um, and I said, how about you, Jacqueline? Are you comfortable using the computer? She said, not very comfortable. <laughs> and so I said, OK, Jacqueline, you are going to sit at the computer. And you are going to use the keyboard. And you are going to use the mouse. And Agre, you can help her, but you can only point at things and you can only give advice. Uh, you can't do anything for her. And this kind of became my mantra throughout my time there, that um, you, can't do, you can't do something for someone else um, and expect them to, to be picking up the skills. They really have to kind of do it themselves, I think. And so um, this is another really good picture that I like. Just kind of showing how I would like development to work, which is locals helping locals, um, and maybe they're interacting with a foreign uh, website, but um, it's not really me doing the work for them at all. Um, just really briefly, this is Ruth. Uh, she contacted me, actually. Um, she called me kind of out of the blue and have no idea how she got my number. Um, but she said, I need you to come down to my business. I need you to see my daycare nursery. And I need you to help me apply for a loan because um, I really want this money to grow my nursery. So I did, and uh, she was super passionate about her daycare. And um, she had like all these cute little children, and she was, uh, had a couple different teachers. And so she really wanted to grow this. And um, so I brought my laptop, and um, she was applying for about an hour. And you can kind of see her intense focus um, on the, the application there. And she didn't really notice me getting kind of close up in her face and taking pictures. So that, <laughs> that's, how, that's how focused she was, and that was really cool to see. Um, going into the field, you're always going to have unforeseen challenges. There are um, <laughs> times when you're going to have your advisor hovering over you, <laughs> pulling uh, at you with a cane. Um, so you're going to have unforeseen challenges. Um, one of the big ones for Zadisha is that uh, there are, um, as we saw with uh, Jacqueline and Agri, people would kind of um, really do a lot of the, the tech work and a lot of the legwork for them. Um, to, to get their loan. And this kind of makes them dependent in the long run. Um, access, uh, th this opens the question of access. Is Zadisha uh, historically was targeted um, just for computer users, um, or is Zadisha going to become an open line of credit to all? It's been trending to this, uh, which is really kind of cool to see. We recently opened up to our loans to everyone, regardless of credit history, um, which I don't know of anyone else doing that. Um, communications, one thing that I'm very proud of is that I helped um, enact change from almost purely email system to um, uh, not purely, but very heavily SMS-based uh, communication system now. So people are actually getting our messages, which is really great, and they can respond. Um, what's next? I'll continue working with Sadisha and learning from them. <laughs> a possible partnership with ICTD Lab Class um, is, is a distant, distant possibility. Um, <laughs> And uh, just to wrap things up, I want to say thank you so much to Revy, who wore a million different hats as a uh, mentor and teacher and challenger and friend and confidant. And uh, that's not an easy position to have, so thank you. Um, Julia, the founder of Sadisha, was amazing and just constantly open to my insights and thoughts and ramblings. And uh, she gave me a very long leash. My family and friends uh, supported the heck out of me. And I could feel just kind of the love from everyone kind of glowing off. So. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Asante Sana. Ask me some questions now or later if uh, we don't have one, time. No, you have one question. We have time for one question. One question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have, yes, we have time for one question for Neil. Oh, are you overwhelmed? Okay, no, there we go. There's Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, they had started using it before I got there, but they're using Telerivit, um, which is, I think, a San Francisco-based uh, company. And we have like a, a phone in country that, um, that is actually like how the, the, the SMSs are sent. And it's not free, but it's like very low cost. Um, so Right. Well, like, we have a... Um, we have an email, or we have like a virtual team here that will send something through email, and that kind of goes like through Telerivit and turns into an SMS, and then kind of vice versa. They can text our number, and then it turns into an email, and we can respond to it sort of thing. Very yeah. cool. I will say that Neil gets the spoof of the year award uh, <laughs> when he decided to Facebook that he had lost his fingers and toes in a freak frostbite accident on Mount Kenya and this and that and uh, it's good to tell your advisor ahead of time because I had like med evac on the way man. He's like, oh, April Fool's. <laughs> We're glad you're back. We did climb Mount Kenya too. So, all right. Well, I keep telling the students it's not eat, pray, love, but they keep 
having fun on Saturday on the couch. It's not allowed. All right. <laughs> Turn this over to you. I don't want to take okay. any. I don't want to give too much time. And that's great. Thank you all for coming. With a sense of sight, as children, we learn about the world around us through observa observations and making deductions between that which we see and the experiences, the and concepts and the symbolic representations of what we've witnessed. Now imagine a different experience where the information you get about the world comes to you through touch, an additive process where you learn about the world around you through making the connections between small bits of information obtained through other senses. In people with visual impairments, the visual cortex has the ability to rewire itself and to become um, increased sensitivity with near tactile perception. So my question is, what are these small strange dots? Anybody have an idea? Imagine, can you, can you imagine what this picture is through just the sense of touch? <laughs> so my name is Abigail Singel and it's my pleasure to be here presenting my practicum work with um, Tom Ye in the Sikuli lab in the Department of Computer Sciences in the Human Centered Computing Lab. And Sikuli, um, it means the, the eyes of God, the ability to see and understand. And throughout this project, we've been looking at how to create an interface to support the parents of blind children in creating tactile storybooks for their children. So in the United States alone, there are 600,000 children with visual impairments, 60 of whom are completely blind. Resources for these students are very limited. In schools, budgets are very compromised and there is barely enough funding to get basic learning materials to the students. Our project is focused on those who, the students K through, or sorry, zero through five years old. And so those resources are even more limited and often depend on the schools, the Montessori's, and the parents to create specific learning tools for their children. And every blind children has specific needs. Even two children with the same eye condition have very drastically different experiences. Oftentimes they are coupled with cognitive development issues, physical development issues. And so it's really important to try to create tools that get their attention and increase their engagement in literacy and developing the skills to have tactile sensation so that they can become proficient and able to live in our world. So this is an example of an interface that we put together right at the beginning of my practicum, thinking about how we could couple all of the different kind of technological needs for parents to design 3D pictures, 3D objects for their children to touch, to feel, to try to understand that representation. Um, this was just an initial iteration, but you can see, you know, we were thinking about how to bring tactile Im images in so that parents could design from those images of the storybooks. You know, thinking about different pages, how to, to adopt um, existing technologies like SketchUp, to, um, which is a, almost the easiest 3D modeling platform um, to, to enable parents to do this. But there's a much larger technical challenge to this project, which I have not yet ventured into, but I hope to. Um, and that is looking at how to capture 2D images and through natural image processing, create 3D objects, and then also going to the 3D printing and finding out how to convert file types, um, STL file types, into the appropriate format. But really the issue is that there's no conversion between creating a model and printing it. What's the interface where you can break down the, the narrative of a storybook that's appropriate for a child? With visual representations, we can see the composition, as you remember from the, the first few slides. But when you're thinking about designing for a child with visual impairments, they only get bit by bit. And so how do you design an object that helps them understand the world around them in a better way? And we want to empower the parents to do that. So again, my, my practicum assignment was looking at this interface design. This is centered around three questions. Um, First of all, how are parents currently crafting tactile storybooks for their children? Um, there are many different technologies, but you know, many people just take out their scissors and cut. And how are they breaking down those narratives of the stories? Um, how familiar are these parents with 3D modeling technologies and printing technologies? And would they be able to adopt them um, in the near future? And thirdly, the most complicated, complicated question is how do 3D models really represent what we want them to? Are they necessary? And that's going to be a question that we're going to be looking into for a while. 
So I began my practicum really wanting to get the practicum experience out in the field. And so I started volunteering at the Anchor Center for Blind Children in Denver. And this is a one-of-a-kind facility that's a nonprofit organization that supports families and children zero through five years old in learning to see. Regardless of what vision they have, the aim of the center is to help these kids learn to see, whether that's through touch or hearing or time. A lot of what they do there is just give the students time to see what they need to see. Part of this partnership building required me to um, lean on my landscape architecture skills, which also was really exciting because I came into this project with a love of tactility and spatial experience. And so I was able to give them a, a small design for how to improve their landscape. And then I brought our lab group out to the site to help volunteer. And I think this is just a really critical partnership because we'll be working with them and the, par the parents of the center in the future to gather more information and hopefully um, show them the interface and introduce them to 3D printing. So through my involvement with the Anchor Center, I have developed uh, a survey for both the uh, parents and for the teachers of the visually impaired. And essentially through the survey, we haven't conducted it yet because we're waiting for IRB approval, um, but we essentially are wanting to look at how parents perceive their ability to get the resources that they need to create individual learning aids for their students for their children. Um, we want to know what their needs are. And specifically, we want to know kind of how they view their children's needs. Can we select books based off of the children's preferences or their abilities or what learning milestones they're at? Or does that not matter? Is it just about having a fun experience? So that's where we're, we're at right now is going to conduct that survey. Throughout the practicum, I've also done a lot of research. Um, since I was here at CU, I spent some time in my office. Um, reading about literacy and development milestones, learning about access technology, and thinking about user experience, both of the parents, but also of children. And um, this is just one angle in thinking about access technology. Um, I've also been mentoring three undergraduate students where we did kind of two um, kind of side projects just to broaden our perspective. One was looking at mobility and wayfinding, and I was mentoring a, a student from the architecture program, and he's come up with a really cool project idea to look at the form factor of tactile storybooks and, and how to create mapping through different object forms. Um, so that's kind of expanding our perspective. And then we are also putting together a workshop um, to teach high school students with visual impairments um, about computer science. And um, so that's pretty exciting. So essentially, this project is about building blocks. And this is what I see as our stack of building blocks at this time. And my role is really to ensure that the, the human values and the, the needs of the parents and the desires and the, the, the future of, and the resilience of the, the children who are working with um, get what they need and get access to the world. So much of our world is ocular centric. And I was just at a tactile, story, or a tactile graphics conference and the leaders within the field were there. And I realized that so much of it was still from our perspective. And to think about how to design things from a phenomenological way, to think about how we heighten our senses, how we should be designing tactile storybooks for all of us so that we can all learn to utilize our senses, our compassion, and um, our love for other people. So, sorry, I just got kind of sidetracked on that. But <laughs> the, the, the point is just that, um, more technically speaking, um, <laughs> I think that, um, again, there's a lot to learn in this process. I've been mostly focused on the human factors, but looking at, again, the, the 2D to 3D image processing, how to import images, how to create libraries of tactile images, how to create libraries of tactile objects, similar to the Google warehouse, um, but how to make sure that they are being composed in ways that are very accessible for a child's mind who only is capturing bits and bits and building up these beautiful conceptual models of what the world would look like for them. Um, so as you can see, the interface hasn't changed too much. There has been some added capacity on the side. And in some ways, for me, this is more of just an outline of future investigations and um, getting more into the, the technical realm as I also balance out um, ethnographic and social research. So I think as we've started to hear within the cohort, um, information communication technology means many different things for many different people. And as I think about ICTD, I think about information as a multi experience of how to translate that information. 
communications is about interface design and universal <coughs> access and making sure that we have everybody's needs addressed at the right levels. Technology is about user-centered design, human-computer interaction, human-centered computing, as well as um, yeah, learning about 3D printing, 3D, 3D modeling, image conversion, natural image processing, and spending time with um, some wonderful colleagues who teach me kind of more of the, the technical lingo. Um, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> so I just want to thank you all so much. I do really want to just say thank you, though, so much to Revy and oh. Ruche and John and Vicky and Tom Yeh. Don't make me cry. You know, I mean, no, the, the two of us can like set each other off for like a day over development yeah. stuff. It's like, you know, <laughs> but this technology is cool. But I just really appreciate everybody's support, so thank you all. Any thank questions? you. Please take some questions. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk a little more about the landscaping? Sure. Okay, so um, at the Anchor Center, they, um, they have a really cool layout where they have different areas that <laughs> You know, there's a, there's a sunflower garden and there's like a mobility track where the kids use their trikes. And trikes are really cool because they um, are kind of the first step to learning how to use a cane because it's using an object in front of you. Um, but so they're kind of having a, a mishmash of what they're doing with certain areas in between these zones. And they just wanted to clean them up so that they could create a pizza garden. So teaching the kids the process of planting, the process of learning, the process of feeling something grow instead of it being this arbitrary concept that they couldn't witness. Um, and now they can witness. And so essentially all I did was design some concrete pavers that just allowed the, the children to sit up you know, two feet so that they have more of an eye level contact with the, 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 the plants. And so it was just a very simple thing. But just I, I found that landscape architecture, for me, I don't really want to practice it, but it's an awesome way to get in and get to know people and really hear people's concerns and how they are perceiving their environment, which I think we're all trying to do. Thank you. Yeah. Other question, Ruby? Oh. Matt. Um, you talked about, about how parents can use the tools to provide effective tools and educational things. Is the goal of the software to parents use it to design educational books and things? Uh, um, thank you for that. So more so translating books into tactile formats or creating their own books. So it just depends on what they're needing. Um, we have met with SketchUp and have learned that, the, that SketchUp is based in Ruby. And so their new beta is more accessible and it's easier to develop extensions. And so we will hopefully be developing an extension that basically simplifies the interface that kind of maybe gives them a limited amount of um, tools depending on their interest and exposure. How'd you sneak in a third question there? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm oh, sorry. I didn't right. You are a special oh, guest there. Oh, so no, 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 we'll take it. It'll be interesting. Okay. Right. I thought it was a little. Uh, well, I just remember the slow steps because slow steps pop up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you have to pop up to see. And so I was wondering kind of what approach you take with that that would be designed for this particular use case? Like, do they stick to a slow speed? So, can I go for it? Okay. Well, this way I'm I can just show you what the first image on the, um, sorry. Um, so we're experimenting with that. That's a really good question. That's part of what we need to, to investigate is, is it really transferable? In what cases is it transferable? You know, when you're really young, you really want a lot of different tactile cues. And so with 3D modeling, for example, you're only getting plastic. And so we're trying to, like, that's part of this is identifying what range that's going to be used for or what even, you know, embroidery might be something. It just depends on the students. So we're going to do some user testing. And so yes. this is an example of the 3D or the um, Good Night Moon in 3D rep or a 3D as a 3D model generated by my colleague uh, Jun Kim. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So during the past few months, I have explored and embraced the notion that participatory photography um, could not only build self-representation skills but would also enhance technical and life skills. To that end, I have partnered with, the, with Seesaw, the community of South Sudanese and American women and men to help share the experiences of recently relocated South Sudanese uh, refugees. This photo 
is a result of that work. Aldo, one of the participants, wanted to focus on the aspects of Boulder that he didn't like. So these are his words and his image. And I can relate to this, and I hope you can too, because that's sort of the power of photography and what drew me to this as an accurate way to build self-representation skills is the relatability. But let's take a step back objectively and think about photography. It's a powerful, universal language that crosses cultural and linguistic barriers. It is adaptable to all abilities and all ages. It is extremely accessible and increasingly affordable. And probably most important in developing context and self-representation context, it's the perfect medium to engage individuals and groups to reflect the community back upon itself, revealing the everyday realities and circumstances that create and influence people's lives. So this all leads me to the hypothesis that you see before you, that participatory photography can not only enable but also enhance and build self-representation uh, and technical and life skills. So with that in mind, today we're going to talk about the following aspects of my project. The methodology, developing perspectives, which is the title of the project uh, for the family I've been working on, key findings, and what's next. So about the methodology, participatory photography refers to a type of project where individuals from a given community or group are supported to generate their own photographic uh, work or digital media. A facilitator, someone like me in my role, um, teaches the group how to use a camera with the aim of uh, helping them to define an issue, conceptualize that issue, and then communicate it through this digital means. It's their words and their images. Now, the, um, the process leans heavily upon the philosophies of Freire and Fanon, critical thinking and taking the power back mindsets respectively. And the basic flow consists of these five main steps. In the first few steps, stakeholder involvement is high, creating an effective internal feedback loop. You work to create a, and, and develop and define an overarching uh, project goal. The next, you secure equipment, and this is during the state, uh, phase two, the planning phase. You secure equipment, the logistics. Um, in step three, you conduct workshops. And this isn't limited to just working with photography or teaching participants how to use a camera. It's a lot more expansive than that. We talk about visual literacy, the appropriateness of taking certain photos, how to build that narrative structure. Um, we talk about ethics. Is it okay to photograph strangers and how so, and the legalities that are implied as well. In the fourth stage, going public, this is usually an external facing component, meaning that the photos that are taken are promoted to an outside audience. So this could be uh, in the form of a gallery exhi exhibition, uh, in a, a website, or even book sales. Um, doesn't, uh, projects don't necessarily have to go external, they can stay internal focused if the issue at hand is, say, therapy. If it's a therapeutic pro uh, project, then the, um, there doesn't have to be an outward component, if you will. Now, the fifth step, you review the entire process to this point and see if you have achieved and met your goals. If you have and you'd like to repeat, there is an optional sixth step, which makes this an iterative process. And that means that in the development context, you have a sort of, um, these projects can go on indefinitely, which I think is quite appropriate, especially considering that community ownership could come into play to reap the benefits of long-term project ownership. So that's the methodology. On to the actual project, developing perspectives. I worked with Seesaw, as I mentioned, and McLean Kinney in specific. This is McLean here. She is the, the executive director of Seesaw. We met a few months prior to, uh, a few months ago, and we talked about the overarching goal of cultural preservation for some newly arrived South Sudanese refugees. So that was the issue that we were going to be addressing, is helping preserve their culture. Um, on the equipment side, I worked with Atlas, and they were gracious enough to loan five Nikon D40 DSL DSLR cameras. Uh, those were supplemented with my own personal equipment, uh, computing and photographic equipment. We met about twice a week for roughly uh, six weeks. We met here in Atlas, in this room actually. We met upstairs, we met at the participants' house. We also met in town, had to go to field excursions, if you will, so pool halls or at the farmer's market. It's a, a scene from the silent disco there on the right down at the band shell, which I suggest you guys check out if you get the chance. Um, but after, uh, so from the very first meeting, I emphasized to the family that I had no goals, no agenda as to the direction of the photos or any outputs. The real takeaway for them on that first workshop was that this was to be their project with their words and their images. This was something they had to help define. Again, the umbrella goal was cultural preservation, but I wanted them to dig deeper and find what sort of narratives they would have within that. So to that end, I had them write down on sticky notes um, how they felt about each of these quadrants, the goals, outcomes, hopes, and fears. 
And as you can imagine, the goals were fairly wide-ranging, um, but they did define it. And this is part of the whole critical thinking and self-reflection part of the process, right? So goals were ranging from learning how to take photos to sharing pictures of impact, telling the story of my life and my children, um, things that we could actually realize within the, the scope of this project. Now, moving on to the actual workshops, before anyone even clicked a shutter, uh, we talked about visual literacy. And this was a really, really fun and engaging exercise. So we broke, uh, we, we had the participants, I had the participants look through a series of four by six prints and sort them, rank them, if you will, from what they deemed to be the best images to what they thought were the worst. And they would take them and describe or explain why they felt this way. So they would look at the photos and describe certain photographic elements, compositional elements, foreground objects, background objects. Uh, texture, light, color, pattern, subject matter, what angle was it taken from, what could have been done to make it better. So they're thinking about photography and they're trying, they're using their words to explain what they're seeing. They're already defining and conceptualizing images, other people's images at this point. So then of course once that was done, we move on to the obligatory camera training so they can take their own photos. And this was really, really quite engaging. I'm a photographer myself and this was just so fun to go through and sort of handhold someone who hadn't used a camera regularly, so it was seeing things almost for the first time. Um, I told them, you know, focus on compositional elements, patterns, as you can see here in the backs of the chairs, or the color of a certain object here in Aldo's gloves. So this is a picture of Nancy taking a picture of Aldo, and here is her resulting image. Not too bad. Again, we went out in public, uh, you call them excursions or field trips, if you will, and this is a shot from the farmer's market, which was a sort of an exercise to build on confidence. And again, part of this program for refugees was not just cultural preservation, but acclimation to a new environment. So here in Boulder, building confidence to go up to the strangers and say, hi, my name is Jackie. I'm working on this project. May I take your photo? Um, so here is me taking a shot of them as sort of behind the scenes. And this is the resulting image or one area, image in that set. So again, we're engaging them, we're getting their confidence up, we're, we're having them tell their own story in their own words. We're also talking about building, a, uh, working different angles and having fun with it. It is photography after all, and that's a, that's a key thing I wanted to take away, uh, want the audience to take away from this presentation is that at, at its heart, photography should be a fun endeavor. It should be something that the participants enjoy. And if you can't see the smile on Nancy's face here, then um, take a closer look because she certainly is having a good time. So after the images were taken, we moved on to selection and editing. And the participants were able to import, uh, we had 3,000 images total. Participants imported them into Lightroom 4 and Adobe product. They were able to uh, then go through that and select them, the images that were most representative of their stories. Then we moved on to editing, which involved sort of a creative editing process, framing, um, cropping, uh, white balance, color correction, those types of things. But we're building narrative structure, building digital media skills, and image editing. Uh, after the editing process was done, we moved on to captioning, Captioning, which covered the basic journalistic tenets of who, what, where, when, why, how, but I also wanted to inject more of um, an emotional component as well, so asking the participants how they felt about a certain image, how they felt about, uh, how they felt when they were taking it, bringing more emotion into it, not just strict standard clinical journalism. Um, again, that builds ESL skills. Now, one of the outcomes early on was that the participants wanted to have a finished book, some sort of publication material. And I'm happy to say that as of today, we have, an, have a book that has 20 of their words and their images, uh, 20 of their images with their words, and it tells their stories. Um, this book is for sale, and proceeds go back to Seesaw, the nonprofit, as well as to the participants themselves. If you're interested, come talk to me or go visit thevoxproject.com. Um, so where does that leave us? The participants learned self-representation skills through photography and writing. They learned how to build a narrative structure. They learned technical skill, skills, not just through exposure, but through engagement as well. They were using a Windows computer. They were using the actual cameras. They were using the software. Again, exposure and engagement. And on the life skills, these are sort of intangibles, but set, they're definitely not to be underestimated or understated, rather. They built con uh, skills and confidence in conceptualization and English language skills, reading, writing, speaking. So where does that leave us? Um, we're going to extend the project to include younger Seesaw members here in the future. Um, we're also going to form partnerships with nonprofits to help secure equipment moving forward. 
Um, and I should back up a step. Extending the project will include younger members of the Seesaw community, so we're going to have a focus on youth. And the participants from this project will take an active role in leading that and training those youth. So they'll sort of have a, tr they'll be a sort of a train the trainer um, aspect to this next phase that eventually will lead into community ownership. And next fall, there is a tentative project slated for South uh, Sudan and Chukudin. So I will close with this. This was a text I received from Michelle Ritter, who is an executive member, uh, executive board member of Seesaw, and it was sent in the spirit of thank you. Um, and it reminds me why I'm doing what I'm doing, and that this work has real impact. And all I can say is it was sent in the spirit of thanks, and I can just echo that back to the family for what they have given me. So thank you. Hi, everybody. All right, before anything else, I want to say thank you very much to Atlas and to Mr. Martin Dormish, who actually came out here in person to see the presentations. It was actually Mr. Dormish's idea to approach the ICT lab class last semester, with which I worked with Joe, Abby, and Manny to create a web-based community networking platform for Broomfield, Colorado. The goal of this was to create something that would act as a community hub to further development not only of communication within the community, but on the redistribution of resources, <coughs> sorry, on the redistribution of resources which otherwise are not reaching people in need. This is that final mile when you have all the resources that you could get to these people, people who need them, people who are just unable to find out where those resources are, and they just don't know how to get them. So how do you get those things that those people need right over, just one more step? When we were originally contacted, the question was posed as one of communication, where the service providers didn't know what the community needed, but as we dove deeper, it turns out the service providers were not only having problems reaching the people of Broomfield, but the people of Broomfield couldn't talk to those who were able to help them, nor could the service providers actually reach out to other service providers and give them the information that they could use to reach their own communities. In addition to this problem, there's an issue of existing information being unreliable in that the information that you were able to find online or in the white pages or even posted in churches and schools was either out of date or completely inaccurate. This information was gained not only from talking to service providers in Broomfield, but by also talking to the Broomfield uh, Social Networking Center and the Broomfield City Hall as well. So the solution to this was to create a community networking page that would act as a hub of communication not only between service providers and, and service providers, but between community members and service providers, as well as service providers outside of Broomfield, meaning that anybody from outside of Broomfield who either wanted to communicate with people within Broomfield or had things that Broomfield members could benefit from would be able to see their need and reach out to them. Inversely, those who had needs that they didn't know how to talk about or how to reach or find help for could go the opposite direction and find help from service providers in the community or to those beyond Broomfield itself. To do this, we needed to create a website that was intuitive to navigate and could be updated not only by the service providers themselves, but the information given by the service providers could be critiqued by the community members. So during the lab class, we created a working prototype, which was then transferred into the initial version of what would be created during the practicum itself. So from that initial prototype that I made with my group at ICT the lab, I ended up making two functional websites. One was the Broomfield Community Networking page itself, which contains a directory of service providers, a bulletin board where people could post their needs and updates about the community, classified sections to say what they might have that other people could benefit from, and forums where community members could talk to other community members as well as to the service providers themselves. In addition to this, a secondary goal was to create a national sister site which would hold information about the Broomfield Community Network itself, the Community Network project as a whole, and, and this is a critical change, would contain a site distribution package where it would contain installation files which would replicate this version of the site standard with the standard setup so that anybody wanting to create a community service network for their community could do so with this package, as well as the obvious documentation and support necessary to keep such a thing alive. To do this, we used a platform of Drupal 7 in the prototype, which I carried over in the practicum as well. Drupal was chosen because it has extensive support, not just that it's free, but that if there were any problems from anybody wanting to set up their own version of the site or customize it further, they would have the ability to do so from everybody having that information online, from reaching out to people in the Drupal community, and from the fact that Drupal is open source so you can change anything you want to change. 
So I altered the default template only because the default template means you can customize it further if there is a need to do so. But I also added and altered modules to improve functionality as well as reaching beyond the site itself. Some of these would not work the way they were designed to work, nor were they meant to be used for a nonprofit or for outreach purposes. However, a lot of them were very useful to do so, and once they were customized further and tweaked just slightly, they were able to work perfectly. These were all packaged together, so all you have to do is download the complete package. It comes with the template, comes with the modules, comes from the original setup. Install it, and the directions for doing so are included in the user manual itself. So what's the results? The results of the practicum in terms of the live pages were the Broomfield Community Network, which is a standard deployment containing all of the default things for communication and for getting those resources to the people in need, as well as a setup in terms of language because the customization needed to be tweaked slightly. Those in Broomfield have specific language needs for the Broomfield lower income communities. But other communities might have needs for more Chinese or Laotian or, you know, Stan Spanish is the default in Colorado, but you can change this further. That's just one example of doing so. The national site, in contrast, is a completely customized installation, which removes some of the communication infrastructure in order to provide static information. These two sites also serve as the standards for anybody seeking to clone these sites, because the national site would be better run by one single person. This contains static information that one person can be responsible for. In contrast, the Broomfield Community Network would need not only a top-tier user to control what's being used, but needs the input of those community service providers to make sure that their own information is up-to-date and that things being posted are not abusive or misleading to the people who are seeking their services. This would contain information like the About page about the Community and Service Network, as well as the file distribution packages, which is where it's currently housed if anybody wants to download them. This one is already opened up to select members of the community. These are people who are in charge of churches, nonprofit organizations, or represent schools. But it will be open to the general public starting this summer. In addition to the live sites, we've got the installation package online as well. So if anybody wants to take this and download it and set it up, these are currently available and can be downloaded at any time. All you do is download them, set them up using a Drupal installation on your own server, and your site is ready to go. This site itself can later be linked to the national page by contacting the national page. The information is at the bottom there if you log in right now. But that way you can network with other community service networks across the country. Each time one is updated, the user manual actually tells you to go to the national page, say that your site exists. The person in charge of the national site will vet that it is legitimate, link it back, and you'll be able to communicate from your site to anybody else around the country, thus extending those communication structures beyond the community itself. So monitoring evaluation. For the original setup during the lab, we did a number of outreach activities. However, for this lab, seeing as it's still in the beta phase and only has those limited users, we had to use a number of surveys as well as a bit of testing on one-on-one -on -one interviews and so forth. However, those have not been very plentiful. I needed to find out how people were using the site if they were not the higher level users providing the information. So in order to do that, I had to ask the site itself. And it turns out it's working rather well. The design things that we came up with during the ICTD lab, the whole easy to use, easy to navigate, were implemented well. And people can find the information they need in very few clips, uh, clicks. Uh, so far, people are only taking maybe one or two minutes to find the region that they need. And after that, they've, the maximum time I've seen so far is about five minutes trying to find a specific listing. Apparently, that's what that person was looking for. But beyond that, they're ready to go. Uh, the server itself has been providing information about the amount of time spent. And that, too, seems extremely streamlined. Everyone seems to be able to navigate it very well. But we're waiting on more feedback. And once we have that feedback, the site itself can be customized further to meet those needs. If it's not easy to understand, we'll fix it. If it is easy to understand, we'll take that, keep it easy, and go forward with it. So the results. In terms of the page itself and the viability of the project, there are still some questions remaining about the financial sustainability and legal status of the project. However, Mr. Dormish has already reached out to the Leeds School of Business, as well as a couple members of the Broomfield community, looking for help with both of these. If anybody's interested in helping with that project, 
the information to contact him and become part of the Community Network Project is available on the national page. Initial feedback about the Broomfield page has also been fairly positive. We're waiting for more actual users and more people who have languages other than English as their first language to contribute to their, you know, contribute their input and help us move forward with what's going on there. But otherwise, everything is fully functional. Initial feedback has been positive, and everybody seems to be able to navigate and find what they need as quickly as possible. The distribution bundle as well, uh, record time for setting that up, complete installation, has been five minutes. That's downloading it and then putting it on a Drupal installation on a separate server. Uh, anybody who wants to participate or wants to try out the installation bundle or view the existing pages can do so by going to socialgoodnetworktool.com. And any additional questions can be sent directly to me at isla.shanuel at colorado.edu. Thank you. So, hi, my name is McLeese Stevens. I'll just get started. So as the final step in my Master's in Information and Communication Technology for Development degree, I decided to spend a three-month practicum in the Amazon River Basin in the Minas province, here it is, of the region of Loreto in Peru. And here are some pictures of what it looks like from the ground. Uh, my main focus was to analyze a two megabits per second long distance Wi-Fi wild internet network backbone, which serves primarily as a VoIP, voice over IP telephone system, as well as internet, or as we know it, Facebook, et cetera, that connects 15 rural health Gmail, um, connects 15 rural health village posts spanning across 445 kilometers of river that runs from the border of Ecuador to the city of Iquitos, the largest city in the world which is not reachable by car. The internet backbone, or the wild network, indirectly serves more than 23,000 people, and that was by a 20, 2005 estimate. My main point of contact was Dr. Alan Mickelson, faculty here at the University of Colorado in Boulder in electrical, computer, and energy engineering, as well as interdisciplinary telecommunications. He's also the head of the NAPONET program, which is a collaborative effort between the partners in Colorado at the university and in Peru which aims to bring health, education, and or commerce services to indigenous communities along the middle and upper Napo River. Uh, the program's main collaborators, collaborators include El Vicariato Católico del San Jose de las Amazonas, which is a Catholic social organization in the area, the Centro de, Sa Centro de Salud de Santa Clotilde, which is a rural hospital which is in the middle, and oversees all of the health posts along the river, except for one. Goral, the regional government of the state of Loreto. GTR, the rural telecommunications group in the Catholic University of Peru in Lima. EJAS, the Enlace Hispano-Americano de Salud, or the Hispanic American Health Link, which comes out of Madrid, and CU Boulder, with a number of new initiatives currently being executed or beginning their execution. Partners and collaborators also include various organizations and companies from South America and Europe. The original wild network backbone was installed in 2007 by the Rural Telecommunications Group, GTR, and the Hispano-American Health Link, IHAS, under a global UN fund to fight malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV. It was also intended to help keep doctors and nurses serving in rural areas by helping them communicate with their families and better with each other through telemedicine services. This is a picture of the surgical room in Santa Clotilde, once again the head of the entire network, uh, which is where I was living in the hospital there, above it. And then this is another surgical room in Taksha Kurarai, which is another indigenous area, just south, 70 kilometers. The NAPONET program, which is at the University of Colorado, began in 2009 with a trip in January to Peru by Mario Vidalon and Dr. Mickelson. Since then, the team has had multiple assessment trips and in the summer of 2010 and 2011 installed educational subnets on top of the already existing WILD subnet, which connects five of the 15 villages for the purpose of long distance education. The subnets were created to be accessed from the schools and used by the teachers and students since all means of travel along the river are by boats and funding for gas money to motor these boats is expensive and thus 
limited. Currently, the NAPONET team at the University of Colorado in Boulder is awaiting responses for a number of funding proposals. The first is being considered by the National Collegiate Inventors and Innovators Alliance for $100,000, as well as the USAID, and a communication-enabled trade association that intends to provide farmers along the river with improved agricultural market efficiency and thereby increase the over in overall income. The third proposal is a coupled natural history human systems proposal to the National Science Foundation for one million, which aims to measure the effects of water quality monitoring on human and river systems. If awarded, funding for each of these proposals will be coming within the next few months, and execution for each will begin this summer. One of the challenges for all collaborators within this wild network, whether they're in Peru or in Colorado, is that because it's located rurally on the river, opportunities for longitudinal study of the network itself and its users or its potential users is rarely possible. And so I saw the ability to live on the river for three months as an excellent opportunity to uncover the challenges that are facing both the wild network and the long and um, rural networks around the world. I'd previously worked on a project on the coast of Peru in 2010, 11, and 12, and I no longer felt that language, which is always an obstacle, nor culture, which can also be an obstacle, would be a hindrance to gaining specific and in-depth understanding of these complex issues, further growing my understanding of development issues that arise all over the world. Dr. Mickelson and myself decided that my initial scope of work would be to discover just how the network was being used and to gain in-depth understanding of the nuances of the Napo River lifestyles as they related to social, economic, and environmental interactions, with the ultimate aim being to help the NAPONET program at the University of Colorado prepare for these summer projects. To do this, I stationed myself in Santa Clotilde, which is the head of all the health posts, about 200 kilometers north from the Amazon River and seven to nine hours in a fast boat from the city of Iquitos. And my personal strategy began with the aim of seeing as many health posts in the jurisdiction as possible. Outside of this, I hope to explore all the means of navigable transportation as well as the long distance business transactions as it's related directly to farmers' livelihoods. My final strategy was to meet with all the collaborators related to or connected with this network, which happens to be quite a few. I began and set up interviews right away with users, with collaborators, with government. Then I spent 12 days traveling upriver where transportation and resources are incredibly limited, very indigenous, very different kind of um, poverty line. I did this with a number of IHAS, the Hispano-American link, health link from Spain, Ignacio Prieto, as he installed new telemedicine throughout the different health posts. And by doing this, I was able to see both the health posts the, the lifestyle, and then see how the people felt about their technology, which was coming in. The next portion of the time was spent interviewing all present and future collaborators. In the end, I sat through 50 interviews, each ranging from one to three hours from authorities, users, and collaborators from the Board of Ecuador to Iquitos and even to Lima, the capital. Then I focused on the transportation services for people along the Napo, as well as product movement to understand how they related to long distance transactions. And I spent some time traveling up and down the river in rapidos, as well as, so here's a rapido, the fast boats, as well as these big barges, which take days. Next, I performed a long distance transaction myself using the long distance Wi-Fi wild backbone and was able to set up a pre-range sale of fruit from Santa Clotilde, which was bought by a private company in Iquitos. The issue with that was building trust, actually. In the middle of March, a member of the NAPO team, Christy Ritter, Dr. Mickelson's DLA student, came down and we performed the initial stages of the NSF proposal by taking water samples from various crucial spots along the river. I also set up a series of meetings to introduce Christy to various collaborators of interest for the summer. By April, I had seen all the health posts with the exception of the four south of Santa Clotilde, which is also different tribes, the Huitoto tribes, which also, so I decided to go down there and see how that differed. Also, they have um, transportation daily. To accomplish this, however, I bought a used dugout canoe. I set up a number of different checkpoints and secure, secure um, areas, and then I rode down the Napo River, and I stayed each night in one of the health posts, calling up and calling down um, to make sure I had arrived. And this took four days total. All of these activities were accomplished by conversation recaps 
an update sent to Revy and other team members, as well as weekly meetings with Dr. Mickelson, during which we would talk about my findings, and Dr. Mickelson would decide how best to proceed from there and ask my support for it. Before leaving Peru, I also made it a point to meet with various collaborators for the NAPONET team to review my initial findings. So here's a quick overall of my findings to this point. I'm just going to go through them incredibly quickly. Financing is always a problem in rural Peru. On this particular project, we have a situation where the previous NGO owners, Ejas, did not realize the great danger they were putting the entire wild network in by handing owner ownership over to Gorel, the regional government of Loreto, who has no desire to pay for health services and refuses to pay for the network in any capacity. Part of the current strategy by the Rural Communications Group, DTR, is to get as many external and state programs involved in the network which creates a demand for the network. However, with a mere two megabytes per second that is shared among 100 to 200 users at any point in time, saturation is becoming a real issue and the network is nearly unusable. Of all the current issues presented by the system, the most concerning to me is the lack of government responsibility and therefore lack of funding for maintenance and innovation. Users are observing that the network is growing increasingly saturated, like I said, and they cannot use it. The main goal of the WILD network was to connect the various health posts and even prevent feelings of isolation for doctors and nurses living away from family. Because of the high levels of saturation and loss of service, whether that's by storm or just old equipment, the network has come to be nearly unusable at all and the main administrators living in the river worry that they will return to where they were seven years ago, completely isolated except for cloudy communications by HF radios. Until this problem is resolved, all potential projects are at risk. This is only one of the many um, complexities of the system now, so these diagrams were created to talk over with various groups with the intention of creating an action-based dialogue around them. They were also presented to all collaborators, with the exception of Gorel, who would not respond to phone calls in order for a meeting. I'd just like to take one moment to talk about the value of D for development in this master's degree. Um, internet, even telephone communications are a luxury in so many parts of the world and unlike the United States where we have telephone lines and we've had transatlantic cables since the 19th century, um, where someone, where I would pay, for example, um, a portion of, of to get to receive internet access in my home, in, I in Iquitos in Peru, 290 users share and pay 500 times more to get just satellite broadcast bits. Um, these experiences are so, are so important because us living in our, our cushioned world of really good technology can't even predict what will happen when we go to a place where people don't care about what we care about or know what we know about. And uh, it throws our, our, our viewpoints of the world for a loop. And it's not until anyone travels outside of their cultural norms that they begin to understand how complicated the reality of international interdisciplinary work really is. It's absolutely necessary that we as students continue to strive to equalize our wisdom and knowledge in both technology and development. Without traveling to another country, one can't possibly grasp the full meaning of all the difficulties that arise. Nor can they predict the beautiful differences that they'll encounter either. Um, one of those the biggest ones there was the perception of the gift of choice. So I've talked a little about the development aspect, but if you're, if you're interested, go ahead and look at my blog here, um, and then you're more than welcome to ask me to send my report to you in two weeks. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the University of Colorado's NAPONET team and Dr. Alan Mickelson for agreeing to work with me, the Atlas Institute's director of MSICTD, Dr. Sarah Revy Sterling, who is continually honest and helpful and a good guiding resource. John, Jill, Vicky, and Roche for all your wonderful leadership. The Grupo Telecomunicaciones Rurales with PUCP in Lima and the Enlace Hispano Americano de Salud, who have so graciously allowed me to accompany them upriver to Alto Napo, thank you, Nacho and Leo, to the Center of Salud de Santa Clotilde for allowing me to use them as their home for three months to accept me there to DIRESA, to EAP, to UCP, and all the friends that have made their way and made me feel at home when I was not. To my family, my mother who came to visit, my father who allowed her, my best friend Skylar Bryony, and especially Michael Banco, who always gives up himself freely, regardlessly. Thank you very much.